so let's start with the basics and the time frame of the period known as Late Antiquity, Late Roman Empire, uh, sometimes also deemed to be the introduction uh, to the Dark Ages, or being exactly the same as the Dark Ages, uh, which are sometimes confused with the entirety of the Middle Ages. Uh, and they are not exactly the same, but they are kind of the early Middle Ages, although that's something slightly different. Uh, history, is, history is very complicated. Uh, but the period spans, let's say, from the time of the Roman Emperor Diocletian in 280s to the rise of Islam near the end of 7th century AD. It is a time that has been almost entirely eradicated from our education systems and culture to the point of no longer really being a part of collective memory of the Western peoples, which is very sad, of course to me. <laughs> you can still encounter sometimes uh, the various laments over the decline of Roman civilization, the horrors of endless barbarian invasions and the rise of the supposedly superstitious religious thinking, repressing the true and pure pluralistic, well-balanced and more or less rational slash intellectual culture of the classical era. A lot of that, as I hope I am about to explain, is a simplification based on the inevitable axioms of the enlightened European intellectuals of the 18th and 19th centuries. In other words, it's a little bit, it's a little bit rubbish. I think the period is greatly misunderstood. As misunderstood as an emo, non-binary, historically marginalized Arthur Fleck. There was a lot of pretty decisive shite going on in the centuries between Diocletian and the Arabic invasions, and even some technological advancements, like the Parchment Codex books, construction of the largest domed building before the completion of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome in the Renaissance, the introduction of a stirrup, the thingy that you, you, you put your feet in when you sit in a saddle on a horse. This is sometimes, sometimes thought to be a Chinese invention, but it was likely invented in the Central Asian steppes and then spread both to China and westward to the Gothic and Roman lands. The Roman Empire was split into two empires, of which only one survived the turmoil of the age. New kingdoms arose from the ruins and ashes of the Western Empire. A religion of slaves became the dominant religion of kings and emperors. The bustlings and industrious cities of the ancient world were gradually abandoned. The, struct the structures of state eroded. The local governments and municipalities regressed into tribes and gave way to the rise of feudalism. The days of uh, the Emperor Justinian witnessed some of the most exhausting and destructive wa wars in ancient history, as well as one of the biggest city riots in Constantinople. At roughly the same time, the so-called Justinian plague caused severe depopulation. Even the climate changed, accelerating the migrations of northern and eastern European peoples, causing even more chaos in the Roman lands. Everything from everyday life to philosophy to architecture to religion to warfare undergoes some deep and often dramatic changes, so I have no hope of even touching all the important subjects. But that's okay, the goal of my talks is to give you uh, a newbie guide to the problems of late Roman Empire, give you an overview of an issue, provide a bunch of links in the description and then send you off on your merry way to, to do your own research. Do your own research, kids. I'm not a historian, so that's, that's as much as I can do, I think. In the following episodes, I will go issue by issue, problem by problem, war by war, maybe character by character, we will see. And I think we need a few separate talks about the wars and the battles of that era, one or two on the religion and the slow emergence of fully organized church, a few talks on the migrations and so-called barbarian invasions, preferably going one talk per tribe but that would be that would be a little bit too difficult perhaps so maybe i will bundle them together in a few well bundles <laughs> and uh, one or two on general state of society and 
and and social institutions so the plan is ambitious like 10 parter at least we will see lucky for me today is a perfect time for a broad introduction so i can be considerably less focused on one thing good for my scattered brain so where to start well let's maybe start at the end why is this decisive and significant age so criminally overlooked I believe it has something to do with one Edward Gibbon, an 18th century historian, the author of the history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, a massive and fabled monography of exactly the times we are talking about here. We may not all be familiar with the book, but we all encountered the views and expressions taken from it, as it has been immensely influential. For example, Winston Churchill uh, enjoyed reading and quoting it. Its dramatic descriptions of barbarian invasions were repeated ad nauseum throughout the 19th century, and it contained one key bit of narrative that was quite popular in the Gibbons generation already and was later popularized uh, as well as used in the ideological warfare of following centuries. The point was about Christianity being one of the main, uh, if not the sole, reason of the decline of uh, the Roman Empire. And really, you can still encounter people quarreling about it uh, on various forums and reddits and uh, twitters and whatnots. And that's, that's, that's weird. That is weird that it still inspires emotions in some people. A problem from, what, 15 centuries ago? The sacred indolence of the monks, Gibbon writes, was devoutly embraced by a servile and effeminate age. So, Christianity was a triumph of the quote-unquote wrong virtues, servilism, poverty and chastity. Gibbon tried to be careful in his choice of words at times, uh, but he clearly stated that the entire 1000 years of history of uh, the Eastern Roman Empire was one long period of decadence and corruption. Byzantine history is, of course, yet another thing uh, taking its roots from the days of late antiquity. Paired with Voltaire's views of Christianity's role in the dissolution of Roman civilization and Friedrich Nietzsche's summary of the problem in the Antichrist, blaming Christianity for the fall of Rome, became a mainstream thing, and so the late antiquity and the Byzantine Empire became a stain on the history of the West, much less worthy of modern man's attention than the glorious days of the Roman Republic and Athenian democracy. I am not equipped to dispute with intellectual giants like Gibbon or, God forbid, Nietzsche at this time, uh, but I must admit that a more favorable view of late antiquity seems impossible without at least a partial excuse uh, for uh, the secular and political power of uh, the Christian Church. Uh, as, it's, as its rise to power is one of the pivotal processes of uh, that age, people like Saint Augustine of Hippo, Jerome or Origen, uh, later known as the Church Fathers, were the thought leaders of the day. The obscure and bizarre to the modern uh, sensitivity ideas of the Holy Trinity and the original sin were formulated by these very leaders. Christianity was persecuted in the classical times, so before our main interest, uh, but the most radical and bloody persecutions happened relatively late, actually, in 260, under the rule of the Emperor Decius. Decius. Decius, or Decius, or, or de, 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 something like this. And in 302, under Diocletian, the latter was the last state-ordained persecution, at least in Roman history, and probably the worst. So that, that's, that, that's, that's a good storytelling technique on history's part, especially that loving Jesus becomes legal only 10 years later, and mandatory about 80 years after that. Well, not exactly mandatory, but um, it becomes uh, the official state cult 80 years later. In the first years of the 6th century AD, the single most impressive and monumental temple in the known world is a Christian church dedicated to the divine wisdom raised by the emperor 
Justician. The Christian Romans were not exactly adverse to some vengeance on the polytheistic Romans. Justinian ordered the closure of the Athenian Academy. Ancient statues of the old gods were often vandalized, desecrated and or stolen. It would be a mistake, however, to think that the dark and grim days of witch hunts and burning people at stakes started immediately and became a norm as soon as the Pope replaced the head of the traditional Roman cult. We are still hundreds of years ahead of the Crusades and the worst thing that happened to the heretic Pelagius in that era was an early retirement in Alexandria near the Great Library. And I can tell you a lot of people would, would, would kill to get an early retirement in Alexandria near the library. At uh, that time, in the 4th and, and in the 5th centuries, this ties into the church structure because there was n it was actually not unified under one papacy, not exactly. Uh, the time for these details will come in later, at, in some later episode. So the rise of Christianity was not uh, a uniquely Roman thing. Before the tragic events of the 5th century AD, the Goths adopted this religion. However, the brand they got from the missionary was a um, different kind, uh, different than what became mainstream later. They followed Arianism and so did a few other Germanic tribes, such as the Vandals. Much later on, it will become a problem in the Vandal-Roman relations, leading to perhaps the first religiously motivated war in the history of Christianity. On the other hand, the shared faith probably helped saving some Roman lives in uh, 410 AD, when the Visigoths under the King Alaric sacked and plundered the Eternal City. The event was shocking. So shocking, it started waves of quarrels, accusations and laments across the empire and all the aforementioned church fathers had something bitter to say about that event. However, some civilian lives were spurred from the bloodshed as they hid in the Christian churches of uh, the city of Rome and King Alaric, a Christian himself, ordered his men to leave the churches alone. This somewhat unexpected turn of events is discussed at length in Augustine's uh, The City of God, where he claims that the churches sheltered not only the Christians, but anyone seeking safety. Relatively humane stuff, considering the chaos and the bloodshed happening for years all around the known world, well, especially around the Empire. For instance, in 406, multiple bands of Germanic warriors, probably coordinating the attack, crossed the river Rhine, the border of the Roman Empire in today's Germany. The Vandals, Alans, Suebi and the Burgundians were among the attacking hordes, all of them later settled within the Roman borders, kick-starting their own kingdoms, after which some regions of Europe are named to this day. Burgundy in southern France, Andalusia from Vandalusia, from Vandals in southern Spain, Lombardy after a much later invasion of the Longobards in northern Italy. The so-called barbarian invasions are a deliciously complicated subject, pretty far from the brain that the depiction of them in the few movies, video games or, or novels that actually try to depict them. Uh, for example, in 2001 movie Attila the Hun, it's a horrible movie, I do not recommend, the, the Goths are for some reason presented uh, uh, as foot soldiers wearing identical fur blankets or something like that, some, some fur thingies on their shoulders and identical plain steel horned helmets. I, and I don't know what exactly it is with our imagination and horned helmets, but it's, it's really it's really absurd. Uh, and, and the actual Gothic warrior looked more like this. Uh, the Germanic and Roman warfare were no longer so different from one another. The old Roman infantry, uh, infantry oriented strategy was gradually replaced by cavalry. The soldier's equipment of a tribal warrior and a Roman soldier became more similar. The dwindling Roman economy became incapable of supporting the empire-wide, somewhat standardized arms production. Meanwhile, the so-called barbarians had centuries to learn and advance their own smithing techniques as well as learn from the Romans. A lot of uh, Roman soldiers were 
barbarians themselves. In fact, even the barbarian kings were often simultaneously the officers of the Roman army. And that's yet another long process behind it. The longer the empire lasted, the more foreigners, let's say foreigners, uh, the, the more barbarians were enlisted as federati, as the allied protectors of the empire. Sometimes they were granted whole lands uh, with their own king. Sometimes it was slightly more, what would you say, slightly smar smarter, but the further we go into closer to the Middle Ages, the more and more there is uh, fully settled tribes. This it ties in with the, with the fall of the economy, because there was less and less ways of, of, of making the military service attractive and rewarding as, uh, as the um, economy dwindled. So, for example, the aforementioned king of the Visigoths, Alaric, was himself a soldier under a Gothic general in the Roman army, later uh, an officer leading a crucial charge in the battle against the enemies of uh, the Emperor Theodosius. The great Western Roman general Stilicho was half Vandal, married to the niece of the same Theodosius. Another Germanic officer of the Roman army, Odoacer, was the dude who sealed the dissolution of the empire in the west by sending the imperial insignia from Ravenna to Constantinople. A generation after the Visigothic sack of Rome under King Alaric, the Visigoths joined the Romans in the great battle against the Huns. The exchange of peoples and ideas between the Roman and Germanic worlds was going on for quite some time, combine that with the commonality of religion between some Romans and some barbarians, the familial and political bounds between the Germanic leaders and the Roman aristocrats, and with the fact that many of the barbarian invaders were actually Roman allies uh, called in to help the emperors in a civil war or in a war against other barbarians, and you will get a picture that is as complex and convoluted and, and, and messy as the diplomatic and dynastic machinations of the late medieval or early modern era. And one last key issue I'm going to talk about today uh, is the stability, stability uh, generally speaking, of the late Roman Empire, particularly uh, the reasons behind and the process of dividing the empire into West and east. Uh, by itself, the division of uh, 395 was nothing special or surprising. The empire used to be divided and then made whole again quite a few times in its long history. One division happened as a result of centralizing the autocratic reforms uh, of Diocletian at the end of the so-called crisis of the third century. Now I know some history buffs may say, well, uh, crisis of uh, the third century is not exactly real, it's a little bit of an exaggeration, it's a little bit of a myth. That is not concluded. The debate I don't think is exactly concluded. I am going with the idea that there was a huge depopulating crisis in the third century, especially in the Balkans, which were actually important for the military. So long story short, this long crisis resulted in the need of, of the central government operating faster and therefore dividing the empire into smaller bits that would be easier to manage. The system uh, known as Tetrarchy had four emperors, two main ones obliged to cooperate and two supporting ones chosen by the main ones. This uh, lasted until Constantine the Great, the dude who also legalized Christianity. After his death, uh, there was a split again and then it was unified briefly by one Julian the Apostate. Uh, then there was a split again and then Theodosius the Great unified it again. Apparently simply holding the whole Roman mess together in one piece can earn you the rank of the great. What made the partition of 395 unique was the fact that there was no reunification afterwards. Another problem was the growing cultural and economic gap between East and West. As the supposedly eternal city of Rome was gradually depopulating, as new seats of imperial power emerged in the west and the new Rome in the east grew rather rapidly, it was a rather realistic and pragmatic move to shift the center of the empire to the east legally, as Theodosius did, granting the eastern emperor, emperor the effective right to appoint his western colleague. 
Some may think it was a horrible power grab. Uh, Edward Gibbon would think it was a horrible power grab on the part of the East. I would think that after two, at least two generations of steady growth of Constantinople, it was only reasonable to grant more power to the emperor who actually had the means and the ability to exercise said power and rule over a, a bigger chunk of empire. Rome was increasingly irrelevant and was sucked twice in several decades of of the 5th century and destroyed even harder by the Romans themselves in the Justinian War of Reconquest in the 6th century, at the very beginning of the 6th century, when the aqueducts were shut off. Horrible, horrible, barbaric, and that was Romans, Romans invading Italy, actually fighting the poor, poor oppressed Goths. <laughs> anyway, uh, meanwhile, Constantinople stood strong and unconquered until 1204 AD, when it was sacked by those pesky, pesky, naughty crusaders. It was also perfectly situated for defense and trade. Its position on the map is one of the keys uh, to the city's great career. All in all, the Theodosian partition helped the empire maintain some stability and preserve the most valuable lands, maybe at the cost of the lands that would likely be lost anyways. The empire was torn apart by great many other destabilizing factors of a much deeper and lasting severity than some administrative alterations. For example, the empire was always importing most of its luxury goods from the outside, while the main offer for the other empires was weapons, tools, metallurgy, generally speaking. As the technological gap between Rome and her neighbors diminished, so did its export. The Diocletian reforms and increasingly bureaucratic and top-heavy administration imposed heavy uh, taxation, probably the most taxation the empire had ever had. Uh, this was likely devastating to the m middle class, well, you know, it wasn't exactly a class-based society, but the closer equivalent, the closest equivalent of the middle class, and froze any social mobility. Uh, some modern historians believe the early empire and the republic had a rather impressive upwards social mobility when compared to any other ancient societies. These, this advantage, that may be one of the roots of Rome's glory, was lost irreparably. Slavery was also undermined, which, you know, long term, long term, very good, very good for us. That's, that's great, that's absolutely great. Whenever slavery is undermined, uh, my heart uh, rejoice. However, <coughs> unfortunately, the Roman economy was uh, very uh, much relying on slave work, and this was a dramatic change. As the empire ceased to expand, it also lost the easiest way of obtaining large groups of slaves. As the slave workforce dwindled, the taxes skyrocketed, and uh, the middle class evaporated. Regional peace and prosperity uh, became more and more dependent on the rich landowners capable of hiring large groups of people. And uh, these landowners also started to finance private armies because, well, there was little money to finance the Roman army, less and less, and there was desertions and a great many problems, so private armies, armies became a thing. Infrastructure, you know, you have to repair this thing from time to time, that was also more and more dependent on the private people, land uh, owners, the, the richest of the richest. So lots of, and lots of it laid the foundations for feudalism um, later on. The same process increased the secular power of the church as the Christian bishops, having some charitable donations at their disposals, disposal, were often more eager and more capable of negotiating in the name of their communities, renovating or building city walls and uh, redistributing goods. Uh, then the government appointed officials. And I think this will have to suffice for now. You have the brief overview of the sorry state of the economy, you have the brief overview of the, of the convoluted states of politics and uh, military, and uh, some uh, very, very broad intro to the, the rise of the Christian church.
as a political institution. So uh, these will be the things around which the entire cycle of, 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 of talks will be based. And uh, let's hope, let's let's hope somebody somewhere finds it interesting. And for now, let's go back to the game. Or why the hell not? Uh, yeah, all right, good. Thank you.